Traditionally, for prostates over 80 grams, many would consider the standard of care to be an open prostatectomy. In my practice, I do not feel that that is a safe option for benign disease. I tend to not simply do vaporization, but start doing more vaporization incision techniques. It's basically a systematic approach using anatomic uh, landmarks and uh, committing to getting to the capsule. This man presents with prostate outlet obstruction from a large intravesical lobe. When I encounter these big intravesical lobes, the first step of the operation is to be able to see it completely. I introduce a cystoscope and identify the landmarks so that I know my limits and I know the anatomy. I need to identify whether there's a median lobe that's intravesical or not, and I need to identify whether the lateral lobes are coapting or touching in the middle. The first step, if the lateral lobes are touching, is to make a working channel. And that is made between 9 and 3 o'clock on low energy with a fast sweep. Once there's good flow with the continuous flow cystoscope and I can visualize the median lobe, the next step is identify the proximal capsule there. That groove is brought out distally to the level of the Vera Montana. The next step is to make laser incisions on low energy at five o'clock and seven o'clock down to the level of the bladder neck and the circular fibers. At that point, I drive up the energy from low energy, which is typically 80 to 120, moving up to between 150 and 180 watts of energy. At that energy, I systematically vaporesect or nucleate or vaporize the tissue between those two grooves. So if I'm gonna wedge out a piece of tissue and release that into the bladder and hope to not use a morselator, I have to use a laser to cut that piece into smaller pieces before releasing it into the bladder. After that, I evaluate the floor of the prostate, which is a central zone. And if there's more than a 30 degree deflection between my Viru Montanum and Trigone, I bring that down. I continue to vaporize there until that tissue is gone, and that's usually done at 180 watts of energy. Once I've completely removed the tissue, any obstructing tissue from the median lobe, I turn to one of the lateral lobes. Usually, the first lateral lobe I treat is the left side, and I make an incision or groove on low energy between 80 to 120 watts between one and three o'clock. And I make a systematic groove starting at the bladder neck and working distally until I identify uh, the end point at the bladder neck, which would be the circular fibers. Once I see that, I walk down the wall with the laser to pedunculate the tissue between the groove I made between one and three and the groove that I had initially made at five. I then come to the apex and demarcate the apex with the laser. So I, I usually do that in a retrograde manner, working away from danger, keeping the sphincter behind me. So I do that to demarcate the most distal aspect of my debulking portion of the procedure. So once you've identified the capsule above and below that tissue, and then also at the bladder neck and distally at the apex, then I feel comfortable turning my energy to 180 watts and vaporizing between these grooves and or vaporesecting pieces of tissue that I sweep into the bladder and later extract. Once I do that portion of the procedure, I evaluate the floor or the base of that lateral lobe. 
and if needed, I continue to vaporize that away. I leave the most distal uh, portion of the lateral lobe at that apex for later in the case because I want to very precisely preserve ejaculatory ducts in the appropriate patient, number one. Number two, I don't want to damage the sphincter and I want to be very cautious there. Uh, and number three, the blood supply to that region comes from the internal pudendal artery. So sometimes you can find a bleeder there that I don't want to waste time trying to control. At the end of the case, if you have a bleeder in that region, the prostate a catheter will take care of that. Once that is gone, I turn my attention to the apex. There's often more tissue than you expect there. So to remove the distal apical tissue, you look around the corner and I tend to work in a retrograde manner away from the sphincter. So I start in a safe zone and I work into the prostatic fossa. I like to tell the residents I work away from danger. So wh whatever the danger is near you, if it's a ureteral orifice, work in the opposite direction. If it's the sphincter, work in the opposite direction. Once I'm done treating that left lobe of the prostate, I turn my attention to the opposite side and I repeat those exact steps. In this case, making a laser groove or incision between 11 and 9 o'clock, dropping that lateral lobe down, demarcating bladder neck and the distal apex, and then turning up my energy again and removing the tissue in between those grooves until you have a nice smooth surface there. At this point, we've already treated the median lobe, both lateral lobes, I assess anterior tissue, and, and I look to see if there's anterior tissue that needs treatment there. If we really started in the anterior commissure, which is one o'clock and 11 o'clock, there should be very little tissue left anteriorly to treat. But if I need to treat that, I turn my energy down, I rotate my scope so that I get the beak out of the way and so that my 30 degree lens is looking at the roof and I very carefully vaporize any anterior tissue that I need to remove. Everyone who's a candidate for TERP is a candidate for green light laser therapy. There's not a difference. But in addition, you can treat patients that you might think are not candidates for transurethral resection. You can treat patients who might be older or sicker. So to do the PVP VIT technique, it's a standard sequence of steps. If, if you know how to do the operation and can execute it and you've selected your patient well and you counsel the patient well on their post-operative course, everyone wins.